In the discussion today, we would be focusing a lot on uh, what we have been experiencing around uh, a topic that is close to many people, independent of which part of an organization you're working on or which part of a, a, a industry you're working on. Uh, I think the area of automation and automation of processes more specifically, and, and not necessarily having it called as robotics, but that's obviously a part of a very important part of what we see as process automation around the world. Uh, joining me today in this uh, you know, webinar that's hosted by IVS Intelligence along with Explio uh, are some very interesting and eminent leaders from the industry. Uh, we have uh, Krishnan Gopi Krish, uh, who is the Group Chief Digital Disruption Officer at uh, GEMS Education, as he calls it, as the world's largest education conglomerate. Uh, he has been, quote unquote, the disruptor in chief, you know, uh, for more than two decades with a lot of experience, most of it in the banking and financial services sector. Uh, he's been, you know, he's worked with various large institutions around the world, including City, Fidelity, First Abu Dhabi Bank, BMI, uh, and more recently with uh, QIB in Qatar and Hilal Bank, Al Hilal Bank in the UAE. And now he is, he is heading uh, the disruption He's a chief disruption officer, as he calls it, in uh, in uh, a very interesting organization called the Gyms. Uh, also with me uh, is uh, Mr. Balaji Krishnamurti. Uh, Balaji is the chief operating officer at the National Bank of Ajira. Uh, again, comes with a lot of experience uh, with international banks, including Barclays and HSBC, and quite a few regional institutions in the past, NBD and QInvest. But more importantly and more interestingly, Balaji has been spearheading a lot of interesting initiatives at uh, his current organization, particularly in the space of uh, you know process automation. And some of my conversations that I've had with him, you know, earlier have always been fascinating. And I'm looking forward to a very very interesting you know conversation with Balaji and his insights. I'm sure is going to be useful for all of us. Uh, we also have with us Vijay Mohan. Uh, Vijay is the head of technical services at Explio. Uh, the technical services, in addition to you know test automation, focuses a lot in the space of uh, process automation and DevOps. Uh, and again, uh, Vijay comes not only from an experience on quality assurance as a space, but uh, he brings a lot of financial services experience, not only with the clients he deals with, but he used to work for more than 20 years, if I'm not wrong, Vijay, with national insurance. Uh, yeah, so, you know, there's a lot of uh, interesting, very rich experience on the panel, uh, you know, this afternoon, Dubai time afternoon, and depending on where you are in the first hour of half, second half of the day. Uh, before I, I get into the uh, discussion today, I do want to, you know, give a little bit of context to how we would structure the discussion today. Uh, we would be having uh, a very interesting conversation with each of the panel members. Vijay also has a presentation to make. I would encourage the audience to post their questions uh, on the Q&A button. You can actually you know, click on it on your screen and you can post your questions. Uh, we would do our best to actually have them directed to the respective panelists and get them answered. What we would also have, uh, you know, it's, it's unfair that you ask us questions. It is only fair that we ask the audience a few questions. So we would be running a series of polls, uh, you know, through the session today, uh, to also see what your perspectives on a number of topics related to today's topic are. So why don't I start with the first poll before we jump to the first panelist? Uh, and here is the first question for uh, the audience. And I presume you can see the screen out there. And the question is, what, in your view, is the primary driver for, for process automation? Is it reduction of cost? Is it improving customer experience? Is it increasing consistency and efficiency? Or is it optimizing your org workforce? Unfortunately, or fortunately, we don't have all of the above as an option. So you will have to choose one of these four. And let's see what takes the lead today. Uh, we'll have another 30 seconds before we'll close this poll. Uh, and it's it's interesting that, you know, some of the topics we'll talk today is going to hover around some of these. 
and uh, the panelists are equally interested to know what you say because they do have some views on this i'm sure as well we have uh, 65% people having voted i think we still have another 30 35% people to poll i request everyone to cast your votes okay and i guess i will close the poll now and let's see the result and uh, the topper of that list is increasing consistency and efficiency interesting right and and people don't necessarily see this as an optimization of org workflows as much as they see the other three options that's quite fascinating uh and akrish and maybe i will in this context i'll jump into uh, you know maybe i'll start with you uh and 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 maybe if i can ask you there's always this misunderstanding right between what is rpa and what it is not so maybe if i can ask you i, I guess you may have to unmute yourself and if you can share with us what your thoughts on that are absolutely ram thank you so much uh, you you are right there is a huge misunderstanding in the minds of uh, you know not only normal uh, staff even with key stakeholders on what rpa is and what rpa isn't i think if we have to speak in english and define rpa rpa is setting up software bots to execute set of repeated tasks in a manner that mimics exactly how a human would execute the same tasks and it's predominantly used for systems that do not have the advanced automation or workflow capabilities now rpa isn't humanoid robotics they are not physical uh, they cannot be emotional they can't take sympathetic decisions uh, they cannot take all the decisions on their own as well at least not yet so even though there are huge advancements of cognitive automation that is happening in the world in my opinion they are miles away from replacing humans entirely interesting so if i was to drill a little down that route i mean what would you think would make or break an rpa initiative considering that it's emotionless as you call it in in what would actually make it succeed and what do you think you know doesn't or makes it a non successful initiative <laughs> thank you having done uh, many rpa projects uh, you know some of them successful some of them not so and for various external reasons and internal reasons let let me give you my perspectives of key factors that would make or break an rpa initiative having a good start is very very important my suggestion of a good start would be doing a detailed business process reengineering exercise understanding what your processes are documenting it understanding how you can do a reengineering uh, you know it is absolutely critical to optimize your processes before automating it let me repeat it maybe somebody missed it optimizing your processes before automating it let's all be very very clear right automating a bad process doesn't make it any better actually it makes it the worse so having a good start with a bpm exercise is the key uh, the second most important is to clearly define the objective of why do you want to do this project or an initiative at all mm -hmm. uh, you know is it to reduce the turnaround times is it increasing controls is it increasing efficiency is it reducing cost overheads is it reducing people just clearly define why do you want to do it what's your north star or what is your end objective and be realistic on how much can you automate right that's the third important point and let's all understand and accept that not all processes are good candidates for automation uh, so you know it's very important to be realistic and over reliance or over expectation on rpa should also be managed especially with the board and the senior management rpa is not your silver bullet it can't solve all your problems at all 
And again, finally, as the famous saying goes, if I ain't broken, don't try to fix it. <laughs> and, you know, that applies to some of your processes as well. You know, you'd be surprised that, you know, uh, that, that is a very, very key word it comes. You know, if I ain't broken, don't try to fix it. The fourth important thing is change management, right? Articulate what is in it for each of the stakeholders. And I always say in this kind of transformation program, it's about 20% technology, reminding 80% about change management, making stakeholders accepted, expectation setting, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So change management is the most important thing. And the fifth one, selecting the right tool is going to make it or break it for you as well. Uh, when, when I say selecting the right product, it's about functional richness of the product, ease of implementation, how scalable is it for every other processes in your organization, how secure is it, what's the total cost of ownership, right integration partner, and a right support partner. It doesn't exist in, in another part of the universe and you, know, you can't get the right support, etc. So these are all key factors in selecting the right tool for your RP, RPA uh, you know, success. The last but not the least, business ownership and accountability is the most critical. Uh, your RP initiative is going to be a huge failure if it is not owned by the right, uh, you know, the right stakeholders. Let's assume RPA is a movie round. The, the HR, the business, and the operation functions are part of this RPA movie itself. They are the directors, heroes, music directors, etc. Right? They are not the audience. They are not there to come, take a nice cushion, uh, sofa, eat popcorn, and to be critic of the movie. They are pretty much parcel, part and parcel of the movie. So those six things I would say would make or break your RPA journey. It's an amazing analogy. Uh, I hope you're not copyrighted it. I'm going to use it. With this. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing. No, I mean, you've touched a very interesting way of putting things right. I mean, if I was to just crystallize it, I mean, I mean, what are you doing it for? What are you doing and why are you doing it? You know, uh, and then how are you doing it? And then who are the stakeholders? I mean, in terms of partners or in terms of your beneficiaries? I think it's a very interesting perspective you've drawn there. But that brings me to I mean, the last point you touched about, right? I mean... And I've, we've always seen this, this movie and so far, although these days with COVID, I don't think people are watching in theaters as much uh, as they do from home. But nevertheless, popcorn is, is always there. The question really is that in your experience, have you, have you dealt with this perception? Uh, and there is a, lo a large perception out there that RPA is generally a technology-led initiative. And you just articulated that be it business or HR or operations are, they are part of the movie and they are cast in the movie and they are not outside us. How do you actually drive, who drives an RPA initiative in an organization? Is it technology? Is it it's business? You know, if you can throw some light on that. So, you know, uh, having Balaji in this panel, I'd be interested to see his reaction to this answer as well. Uh, for me, RPA is not a technology-led project. It is a business-led initiative that is supported by technology, not the other way around. The sponsor should never be the CIO or CTO. It should be the CEO or COO or the business head of that function uh, for a primary reason that the stakeholder needs to be bought in, not the enabler, not the implementer. So, you know, that, that's my personal opinion. You know, my, my experience has shown that if it is business-led, it has huge benefits than the other way around. But you have this perennial, and you started by saying these are not humanoids, and there is always this looming concern in everybody's head that, you know, RPA is out there to take away people's job. And especially when business leads these initiatives, uh, A, I mean, how do you deal with that uh, perception? And B, how true is that perception? So, you know, I, uh, you know, there are a lot of people who say people are, uh, you know, uh, people are afraid of robots will take their jobs. 
you know, uh, and uh, and I'm and I, you rightly asked, uh, will robots take people's job? Uh, my my answer to those people are, uh, you are more likely to be replaced by somebody who knows how to use a robot than actually being replaced by a robot, right? You know, uh, and I, I think that will be the true for years to come. Well said, well said. I, I think that was a very fascinating um, perspective there, uh, you know, Krishan. Uh, Thank you. There is, there is one question here from, from uh, Dimutu, and I'm going to pose that to you. What do you have to, what is your take on the, the poll answers that you got to see, right? When people said efficiency is the primary driver or they saw it to be the more prominent, pertinent driver than others. You have a view on that? I think absolutely. I think our audience are much more knowledgeable about RPA, which is a great sign. Efficiency is one of the key factors. Standardization, consistency, uh, you know, having the, uh, the, the right controls is one of the key factors. And I am so happy to see that answer that most of our, uh, you know, participants today uh, are already, you know, in much more steps ahead than most of the stakeholders that you would see now. Yeah. Excellent, uh, Chris. Thank you for that input. And we'll probably come back to you when there are more questions. But I just want to go on to our uh, next panelist uh, today, uh, Vijay Mohan. Uh, Vijay, you have a presentation, I pre presume, you to actually make to our audience today. Uh, yeah, Ram. I think, uh, Ram, just just to add an, on a note of uh, a lighter note, I think you need to recheck the introduction you made about Chris. Because from what he has been saying, it appears that he has been even involved in uh, process implementation and process automation all his life, not just in uh, banking and education. Not so, at all. I think he's a he's a disruption <laughs> officer by definition. Yeah. So, <laughs> which I, I guess more accolades your way. <laughs> uh, I'll just share my uh, screen so that uh, is it visible now? Uh, yes, it is. Yeah. So I'll just give a short introduction before I move on to. Uh, process automation. So uh, we are XPO Solutions, part of the global XPO group, which uh, provides management consulting, engineering, as well as quality assurance services in more than 30 countries globally. So uh, we serve different verticals, different industries, ranging from aviation, BFSI, banking, uh, entertainment, uh, education, and so on. And uh, this exposure to multiple industries has uh, really helped us to innovate as on the technology front, so much so that we are recognized as leader in next generation and digital software testing services by Nelson Hall. Now, as far as XPO Solutions itself is concerned, we specialize in the BFSI domain and additional domains such as education. So some of you may know us from our old uh, avatar, that is ThinkSoft Global Services. Uh, we were then merged with the SQS group, and we are now part of the XPO, XPO group. A key aspect of our services is that uh, there is a fusion of both the domain aspect and as far as the technology aspect is concerned. So when I say a fusion of a domain, it's not just people who have uh, experience in delivering these services in the particular industry, but actual experts and SMEs and business analysts who are drawn from the industry. For example, if you look at our BFSI delivery as such, we have SMEs who have worked for decades in the banking industry. We have business analysts who at a minimum have put in five, six years in various operational roles. And this combined with our uh, technology expertise helps, helps us to uh, give a perfect uh, fusion as far as delivery is concerned. And this is particularly important when it comes to process automation. I think uh, what Chris said is very important in the sense that uh, business needs to uh, drive this initiative. And it's not just a business driving this initiative, it's also the knowledge of business aspects that plays an important role, even from the implementer's uh, perspective. And uh, as you're aware of uh, ev the evolution of process automation as such, we've had uh, personal productivity tools being used for a long time, but uh, the, over the past few uh, decades, the couple of decades, I would say, robotic process automation has also caught on. Like uh, Chris rightly pointed out, the focus has always been on the end user and UI level uh, automation as such. Repeatable processes act like a human model of automation as such. And uh, for the past few years, due to the enrichment of AI and ML techniques, 
We also have various aspects as far as cognitive automation is concerned, whether it is, uh, you have a lot of acronyms being thrown around here, cognitive automation, intelligent automation, digital process automation, hyper automation. But basically what it involves is a fusion of these techniques of RPA along with AI and ML techniques, computer vision and various other aspects so that end-to-end -end process can be actually completely automated. This is still, I would say, a goal which is uh, which is yet to be reached. There, uh, there is a lot of work in this regard, but we are making small advances as far as the technology is concerned. And coming to the trends, it's quite interesting that uh, regarding the poll that you uh, showed, uh, Ram, because uh, when you look at the key drivers that uh, we asked about, it's remarkably similar to what we see as far as global trends are concerned. And uh, of course, any poll, as you know, just like these uh, pre-election polls has have to be taken with a pinch of salt, but they do give us some insights as to underlying uh, trends as such. And when you see the drivers as such, while increasing the efficiency is a key aspect, uh, various other aspects such as the customer experience are coming to the fore, especially with COVID, because COVID has been a real wake-up call as far as automation is concerned. If you look at the investment areas, for example, you would see that it's more mainly the back-end process that have been the focus of investment, mainly because these are the type of process which allow you to do unattended automation. That is full automation of the end-to-end -end process, unlike the, say, the customer-facing uh, areas. But the problem that uh, COVID threw up was that uh, a lot of the customer interactions was really impacted. And uh, in where the clients had actually focus only on the backend process, they were not able to fully utilize the uh, their uh, automation as such or their RPA aspects as such. Though there were some, uh, especially in the BFSI sector who were able to utilize uh, RPA for repapering aspects such as their recomputation of the loans and the terms and so on. But uh, we do see a dramatic increase as far as uh, process automation is concerned and especially around the customer servicing areas, because even if you fully automate your backend process, unless the you are able to service your customer, your, your uh, business model, of course, fails. So this is an aspect that has come into the fore as far as uh, COVID is concerned. So business resilience has become an important aspect when you think about actually going about your process automation. And uh, on the flip side, of course, while there are a lot of positive aspects, we still hear about a lot of uh, failures as far as RPA is concerned, whether it is a uh, failure to uh, reach the cost benefits originally envisaged, whether it is a cost of implementation, whether it's a speed and so on. And again, uh, a point again is that a lot of these discussions are only around the technology aspects, the aspects typically around automation, analytics, AA, and all those aspects. But what we emphasize, and I think uh, uh, some of uh, Chris's points were also very, very focused on these areas, where that we need to focus more on the enterprise trifecta, the people, the process, and the technology aspects. Of course, central to all this is the people aspect. I think uh, some of you may remember that uh, at the beginning of this century, the most uh, favorite and the most well-known business acronym was business process reengineering. But BPR has now virtually vanished as an acronym because the change management aspects were ignored at that time. And hence, the entire uh, move as such for BPR was a failure, though it has been repackaged now in various other forms. So change management is critical. And not only do you need the buy-in of your stakeholders, you also need the buy-in of all those in your organization as far as the business is concerned. So again, how do you go about this? One way is to understand what where, this, where these stakeholders come from. For example, your sponsors are more interested in the top line and the bottom line aspects. So you need to look at automating process which actually impact that. At the same time, if for example, you go in for your automation of your internal process for finance and HR, your, you get an internal buy-in as such at all levels. So these are aspects you need to actually think about when you, uh, when you go about the people aspects. And regarding the process aspects, when we talk about process, we are not, not just talking about the implementation aspects. We are talking about the actual uh, selection of process for automation. And like uh, Krish was had pointed out, optimization before automation is absolutely important, especially given the fact that in the BFSI sector, many, there are many legacy processes which are very, very poorly documented, let alone optimized. 
So this is an opportunity also for organizations to really document, op optimize, document, and then automate all the process. And again, like I said, business resilience is coming to the fore. So it's not that you need to think about a full end-to-end -end optimi optimization. If a process is critical, you can also think about uh, automating certain aspects of it, while the rest, the key aspects of it are, are handled by the human uh, uh, specialists. And lastly, coming to technology, and I say lastly because I, we do see from our experience and from the experience of all our clients that it's the people and the process that matter. Technology is, of course, the foundation, but it is the least priority as such when you look at this trifecta. When you look at technology aspects, uh, like uh, Krishad had pointed out, you need to, first of all, think about the implementation aspects in terms of the tools that you bring in. And another aspect, aspect is also your technology roadmap as far as your enterprise is concerned. Now, uh, of course, your uh, systems of record, like your mainframes, they are not going to change. That uh, it is only your systems of interactions which are bound to change. And given the current rate of change of technology, you can expect changes every few years down the line. So you need to actually plan for this automation as part of your integral enterprise technology roadmap. So these are the three aspects we think are actually key. And from our ex experience with all our clients and with our with the, the track record that we have, this is something that we are repeatedly pointing out to all our clients. And how do we actually go about this? Like was emphasized in the dis initial uh, discussion, it's important to be business driven. And a center of excellence model is what we strongly recommend and which has proved to be very successful in all RPA engagements, which have really actually made it to the uh, success gate as such. And when you talk about a center of excellence model, we are talking about people drawn from business units. We are talking about people drawn from HR. We are talking about process specialists. We are talking about IT. These people representing all this driven by the business, responsible for various aspects of this implementation, like governance, communication, enablement, collaboration, and so on. So this is this sort of a center of excellence approach for process automation as such is a key enabler as far as RP, RPA or process automation or intelligent automation is concerned. And when you look at an overall roadmap, when we talk about a roadmap of uh, automation, process automation, this is the typical roadmap which has proved to be very successful. Uh, a clear enterprise level and a strategy where you're very clear about why exactly you need to go about automating things. The objectives, it can be it can be merely cost cutting. It, it, that, can, that can be an aspect, but it can also be other areas like uh, uh, business resilience. It is important that all these aspects be first looked at and then you decide on which process to go about. And like I said earlier, optimizing the process is critical before you actually go about autom automating it. The, the process selection criteria must reflect all your objectives and be chosen accordingly. And given the current state of tools, you can also always go in for quick wins as such, where you take about standard process, which are well suitable to uh, uh, rapid automation, end-to-end -end automation, go about imp incremental implementation to get buy-in, and then look at specific areas where you can bring in various cognitive aspects, utilizing data which you gather. And here we are talking also about having a very clear data policy, because one aspect of data is that it you need to look at the quality of data as well as security, given the regulatory considerations. And data plays a key role when it comes to cognitive and intelligent automation. So this stage-by-stage -stage approach is what we have seen to be very successful in automation initiatives everywhere, as far as process processes are concerned. I have a few interesting case studies which are relevant to what we have discussed so far. Uh, coming to these case studies, there are some of the engagements that uh, the RPA Center of Excellence that we have at Explio Solutions have successfully delivered. And we have expertise in a multiple range of tools. So it's not that we go, go with a single tool and uh, force fit it into the customer's requirements. We, based on the customer's specific needs, their roadmap, we actually provide the consulting services in the strategic direction for them to not only select the tools, but also identify the process and then carry out a POC as well, and then have the COE set up and work on continuous improvement model. So coming to the case studies that uh, I had uh, talked about, this is a typical case study of what would be a standard and RPA 
uh, automation as such, where you are taking a high volume process, which involves a number of FTEs, which has a number of uh, business rules, which uh, lead to which could lead to manual errors. This is a perfect candidate for an initial automation process automation, end to end process automation, and where you can immediately see benefits and uh, uh, benefits, direct benefits in terms of cost savings and also uh, as far as quality of uh, work is concerned in that ma manual errors are reduced. A second uh, case study is a typical area where uh, RPA or process automation sign shines in the, in the sense that it spans across multiple technology stacks. Generally, if you look at the BFSI sector, you do have multiple technologies in place, a, a mainframe or a mini at the back end. You have most modern technology stacks at the front end. So uh, auto automation as such over these requires a robust tool which can span these technologies. And uh, this is one area where the process automation tools today are uh, really good at because they can be used for different technologies so that the process which spans multiple technologies can be easily automated from end to end. And again, here, this actually helps to eliminate a lot of manual uh, aspects, including uh, improving quality to a great extent. And uh, this case study is a typical example of uh, what I would call is, uh, an, uh, is an attended automation uh, prospect. Uh, I'm sure that all of you are aware that uh, as far as AI and ML is concerned, over the last 10 years, we have made a great number of advances. It's We have uh, even, uh, as far as the game of Go is concerned, which is, is considered to be even more complex than chess, we have now uh, programs which can actually beat the uh, highest human expert in the world, the world champion in Go. But one uh, aspect that has, which is probably never going to be conquered by AI and ML, Though there are a lot, there is a lot of optimism on that front. Is the aspect of handwriting, especially a doctor's uh, handwriting, and I know that uh, that's a challenge that even uh, the doctor himself faces when he looks at his prescription after some time. So, but these are areas actually where you can look at the current solutions, where at least you get a great degree of accuracy, so that you can automate to a great extent the process, while you can still have some human inter intervention to check on certain aspects of this process. So it is not that uh, you need to look at a totally end-to-end -end automation. You can also look at automating key aspects of it and having a human intervene only at the critical as critical areas. And uh, when you look at process automation tools, a key aspect is uh, the cost aspects. And uh, the way you maximize your utility is an important aspect so that uh, there are also uh, cases where we have actually helped our clients to utilize their uh, RPA uh, robots, robots when they are not being utilized for production work into in test automation. And uh, this actually helps them to leverage their licenses and optimize the costs of using these tools to a great extent. And uh, coming to the aspects of optimizing process, selecting process uh, properly, this is a key aspect before you actually venture uh, into a full-fledged automation uh, process automation. And this is where you actually require a business knowledge, a domain knowledge as such, which can help you to actually select the proper process, help to optimize them, and also come up with a proper implementation plan. And uh, this case study with a large insurer is a typical of this where this process was rigorously followed after a earlier uh, i would say uh, certain lack of benefits being shown this process was rigorously followed so that clear benefits could, could be actually shown from the uh, rpa implementation and the final case study i have here is more in terms of the cognitive and the ml aspects where we are now starting to push the boundaries here in terms of uh, automation so it is not just a straightforward uh, implementation where you just have a rules-based uh, workflow which can be automated. Here we are also looking at tapping into various M AI and ML aspects, which will actually help you in predictive analysis as far as your automation is concerned. And anti-money laundering is an area, of course, which all banks are interested in, and which is a key area which can be uh, which can be thought of for this sort of a solution. So I think uh, these case studies give you an idea of the various specific areas in which you can think about as far as process automation is concerned. And to emphasize the key to success that we think is one, for it to be very business-led, 
think of the trifecta the people aspects the change management as aspects think think of it in terms of the process aspects optimize before opt, uh, before automation don't think only about totally unattended process think also about attended automation to get maximum business benefits especially business resilience and the third aspect is of course the technology aspects the right tool which has an open uh, open uh, apis as such to tap into other integrations and fitting into your technology roadmap and to integrate all this think about following a coe model that, which provides you the actual benefits of driving this in a very 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 clear and transparent manner and uh, provides benefits to all stakeholders so i think uh, those are the main points that i want to emphasize and uh, like i said from uh, the points that uh, krish had said earlier i think many of them resonate from our experience with all our, all our clients so i think uh, like i said uh, ram i think you have to add this qualification also to krish's uh, profile i think as being a specialist in this and i'm sure that balaji who's waiting with his insights will uh, echo some of the uh, these aspects also thank you thank you vijay um, very interesting and i think you stole the show with the doc doctor's prescription in india i mean so <laughs> i think <laughs> i guess there are people in the audience out there who already have started figuring what to do there uh, uh, before we jump into uh, a very interesting discussion i uh, looking forward to have with balaji i do want to go back to the audience uh, with uh, another poll uh and i think uh, this will also set the tone for you know what could be a very interesting discussion we'll have with balaji here's a question uh, ladies and gentlemen which of the following is in your view the biggest challenge for automation right process automation is it the resistance to change from people is it the ability to prioritize the right processes is it the is it the right tools and expertise or absence of it or is it the investment that you need to make uh, to have make this happen yeah it's interesting i'm 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 having these and as as i mentioned before all of the above is not an option unfortunately so while we are waiting uh, for the audience to poll uh, there is uh, uh, indeed a question um, you know going back uh, to what was polled last time and maybe i'll start with that with uh, with you vijay before we move on even if it meant efficiency uh, you know uh, that was the poll that everybody polled the question is doesn't it all mean eventually to increase customer service i'm not sure if that is really true i don't know i mean any of the panelists you may want to take that question yeah if i may take that uh, question up when you talk about efficiency it can mean various things to various people actually when it it uh, it all, it it's merely focuses on quality as such the quality of work and uh, how fast you can do it and uh, this can relate to any functional area whether it is hr whether whether it is uh, your uh, customer service so it is not specific to any functional area as such it's more of a broad based approach but uh, uh, looking at uh, various aspects as far as investment and all is concerned what i would suggest is that uh, we look at from the functional perspective also like i said customer service is the most important aspect if you are not able to service your customer there is no point in automating all your process the back end if you are not able to interact with your customer so we need to look at it in a more holistic manner and not i would say silo it into various areas it's all good for a poll as such for us to get a general understanding but uh, we need to have a broader look from it's not either or yeah. i agree yeah. i mean it doesn't have to be either or it is certainly not either or it's it as i said all of the above has been consciously kept out as yeah. option but i agree i agree so let's see the results of this poll um, and that's quite interesting so we what we see here is that choosing the right process seems to be the biggest challenge that people have <laughs> bala ji that's that's quite interesting and i i guess that's really sets the tone for what i may have to come to you with uh having done this and i guess balaji you've done more than i don't know 60 plus processes you said in the last couple of years alone that you have helped uh uh automating so if i can start by asking you what are the guiding principles you have when you select the right process or prioritize the right process you know in choosing yeah sorry i think that's uh, first of all uh, thanks ram and my fellow panelists grafton and also the audience is good to be here 
Uh, I think it's you're asking a, not an easy question, okay? And I wish I can make the answer as simple as that because in an organization, uh, more than people, process systems, everything has to work efficiently. Uh, and we had unlimited time and unlimited resources, life would have been much easier. The challenge happens is when there's a competing interest comes across and you need to manage it in a specific particular way. And it also depends on the life cycle of the organization, what type of teams you have, what type of dependencies. So if you have to look, sort of make the decision, it's quite multidimensional, depending on which prism you're looking at from, okay? So a few consideration which uh, Krish clearly articulated, so did Vijay, was in terms of customers. We need to consider in terms of what our regulations are, what is strategic, what is tactical, what is business as usual, the technical capabilities, internal as well as our ecosystem from the vendor's point of view, uh, the, the type of constraints you have in whether it's the time, resources, okay? So there are many things which happens. The way we approach generally, especially on the larger decision-making process, if I have to make a decision around it, uh, is in terms of looking at the wider strategic intent the business need, and more importantly, the organizational change management considerations. Hmm. Because that then sets the tone in terms of what you achieve within that time frame. Because if unlimited time, you'll do everything. If unlimited resources, you'll do everything, right? So that's the first thing we try to keep in mind. And when you think about business, the core to any business is the voice of customer which is can be external customer, which truly so, because they gen, because of them we exist. There's a revenue aspect to it. There's a business aspect to it, as well as the voice of customer internally also. Because uh, as uh, Vijay was mentioning, if you look at it, the way organization has formed, especially in the financial services, it was manual. Then it went into different applications. So there's the silos around it. The evolution of technologies have happened. So you're in a different life cycle when you stand and you have to hear all these noises when you make that decision, okay? And this sort of helps us in terms of, so we have like customer satisfaction survey, employee satisfaction survey, the data. So data becomes an important component of what we decide. The complaints, the query managements, okay? Benchmarking to the industry, what our competitors are doing. Because you may want to do something just to be, if I use the word of disruption, be in line with the market at that point in time, okay? So these are some of the things which we consider. And if I have to give an example, uh, and I think, uh, I think it was uh, Vijay who mentioned it. So internally, I think one of the questions also, you had resistance for internal resistance to change. I won't use the word internal resistance to change because a lot of time we use this acronyms, RPA, BPM. I personally don't understand a lot of these things. Okay, I'll be very honest. But what I do understand is if somebody tells me something in a simple language, it helps me to understand. So one other thing is if in this journey, people don't see any benefit of what is going to happen, if they automate and RPA does the repetitive task of an inputter of a job, what motivation he has to help you build that RPA? It's not possible. Similarly, there are pain points. For example, uh, and these examples are used multiple times. Uh, normally, we give staff loan. And this, every staff can have, right? From management to the junior most clerk can have a staff loan. So we went through a brainstorming session when four years ago, we talked about digitalization and the best way to approach BPM. Okay? And most of us didn't know how to go about it. Of course, we got a lot of feedback from... Uh, the consultants, the feedback from uh, the players, industry players, tech players. And when we went across the poll with different stuff at different levels to internally, what came across was, why don't we try this stuff? Well, for two reasons. Sometimes the paper, when it moves from one desk to other or from geographies also, because we are located in the head office is somewhere else and HR is some other place, it becomes a challenge. Then the usual regulatory around, you know, whether you have any other loans, how much can you repay the engine around it? The third thing is 
which came across is somehow the manager have to sign off for the stuff before it goes to HR. Okay, and maybe they're sitting on, on, you know, on it. So when we went through that process, so at that time we looked at, okay, we need to engage with the staff. What is the best way to do that? So let's do a BPM of staff loan. And across the value chain, initially a lot of criticism was there, a lot of not understanding was there. So it doesn't mean that people are resistant. They just want to understand more. And you have to be patient because it's a long term playing game. It's not short term because digitalization cannot happen in one year. Okay. And you have to allow people to readjust. Mm -hmm. And in that exercise, when we went through that, so we went through that process, it really, really helped us in what we do from an external point of view. If I take about the first thing, every banker would talk about is customer onboarding. Okay, whether through an app, through a tablet, through a branch, various channels. So I won't get into the technology of omni channels and various other things, but simply put together, the, there's a first experience the customer is having when he's opening the account. It can be from the branch. The branch has to set the process to the central operation who have to do something. And then finally, the fulfillment, giving the credit card or debit card and various other things which use external vendors for us. So in that journey, when you look at it, so the customer onboarding is a natural which came across as a process which we need to focus upon and learn from that. We don't claim that we'll know, understand everything in one go. And once you make it a success around it, it becomes easier. And one beautiful thing came out of that was when you went through that process, suddenly the branch guy said, we are doing extremely well, we are doing quickly because we started getting the metrics. The process metrics are available. The operation is saying, oh, we are doing soon. And the other thing came across as, oh, compliance or somebody else is taking time, for example. But then we realized there are a lot of false positive comes across because the way you capture the data, then the concept of RPA evolved from there. So it wasn't that we planned something with that. We started with the BPM process. So I think there's a lot of learning and we should be open to the idea of how we want to go about it. You know? And we as management or even the staff, because the leaders can come here, not necessarily from management. It can be a junior staff in a business who can lead it. So I think that's something which we all ourselves learned. It was great. But normally as a bank, you have to document a process. Yeah. You have to say what are the benefits, what are not benefits. So things like we consider like, okay, listen, high value, low complexity or high value, you know, uh, high complexity. Okay. So, so this type of things we sort of consider to say, okay, what is the things to uh, make it an impact. And of course, there is a level of politics also we need to manage because there's a buy-in which has come. So for example, if a revenue generating area decides this is what I want, for example, then you need to get their buy-in because that may enable you to fast track quite a few other processes. So it's not only about efficiency and various other things. It's all about how do you manage the ecosystem, you know. But I, I guess, Balaji, I mean, you touched another point, right? And I want to go back to something else that uh, uh, you touched very briefly, right? You talked about metrics now being measured and suddenly you actually are having a higher consciousness of the data that is being captured, right? I mean, honestly, one may not have 100% of data accurate initially, right? So you embark on a process on the journey and then it's a long journey, right? So how critical is data to this whole process and how do you deal with it? Uh, in one word, I have to say just critical. <laughs> How critical? It is critical. Okay. Again, depend on which prism you are looking at from and why it is important. Because normally the whole data is about customer. So for example, just the static data of a customer, having the right telephone number and an email and an address clears a whole lot of efficiency backlog, for example. The other thing is, if you have the right metrics and the right data available, your ability to service the customer, the client servicing part of it. Because if you don't service your customer, he has no intention to deal with you. It's as simple as that, because it's highly competitive environment and you need to be on the top of it. Okay. Similarly, if I think from a compliance perspective, because they are now it's getting more and more important. Okay. We need to fulfill the regulatory obligations. So then it's very, very important in which you do in terms of servicing your customer. So the end result may be to service the customer, but why would you make the internal noise which takes time to service your customer? 
Similarly, from a fraud risk management perspective, because you have to protect your assets and various other things, you may need to do that. And when you build a process with a digitalization for assuming, you also get the metrics to follow through, look where the clogs are and what you want to do with it. So the data is very, very critical from the, whichever prism you look at. And it was always important. The new technologies is enabling it much more faster and easier because some of the tools which some of the panelists spoke about, which is uh, mainly to do with uh, OCR tools uh, or uh, uh, you know tools like RPA, AI, and or even intelligence scanning, because nowadays no, you don't have to input anything, which is a COFAX or various other things which people do that. So when you capture the right data, the source, it becomes easier. Previously, organization was suffering with availability of data. So not only you think about availability of data, integrity of data, accuracy of data, and more and more when you get into digitalization phase, the information security aspect becomes that much important. The client data, how you protect, that is your key asset. Hello. And harness it, it can become a challenge. So these are some of the things to cut it. From NBO perspective in this journey, uh, there was a quite a bit of learning. We didn't have all the data. So as you said, you say, okay, uh, there was a brainstorming on customer onboarding. Mm. So you can always an open account with knowing, just putting few fields, but other fields may not be available to do certain things. So you then make those gap analysis, identify what is required. And then parallelly, when you build this system, you also need to look at your legacy data and fine tune it. Of course, people will talk about structured data, unstructured data, the formatting of data, various other things which come into it. You may need to pick up the right noises and to see how you manage. So the overall data governance, if I have to use, becomes paramount. And data governance doesn't mean that it is again one of the functions. It is has to be led at the topmost level at the bank. Okay. So in our so in our organization, when we talk about data governance, the most of the key stakeholders in the data governance are the CFO, CRO, the head of business, uh, the head of different businesses, the risk guy, the infosec, and the operations. And of course, IT has to be there because they have to make it and enable it happen. And I think these are some of the things which we consider in terms of when we went through that process. So I think it's very important. That's going to lead it. Okay. And the good thing is, the technology experts who are there, the tools are available, which makes it much more easier. Of course, the life cycle of anything what we do is now shortened. It's not like you can do once and sit back. <laughs> it has to be an ongoing process of managing and measuring those data. In fact, that's the, I mean, one of the other Im implications of this, uh, Balaji, is that, you know, your stakeholders, be it your shareholder or your management or anybody who is investing in any of this, will be wanting to know what has been the return on investment, right? There is always an impact measurement that always, you know, and there is there is a element of qualitative aspect to it and a quantitative aspect to it. How do you, or what would your experience that you'd like to share to the audience on measuring impact here? Uh, again, you know, I wish it was so easy because when I go to either to the management or the board, getting a, a project a, approval or a, a budget and we are at the planning stage, it's never going to be easy, right? However, everything starts with your strategic intent of what you want to do, because you're one of the players within the ecosystem, okay? So for example, uh, most, most of the time we talk about, we are corporate banking, mainly corporate banking business. We do have retail banking as a thing. We Now we're going into doing Islamic banking and various products. So you build around your strategic intent of what you want to do you then have to position yourself mm. in terms of deciding what is critical based on again various metrics as i'm talking about okay and you come to a not a one year plan you have to come up with a three year plan or a four year plan depending on how much you can do because this is a journey it's not one time exercise and also even all the budget is given you cannot do it in one year just getting the right a partner, implementation partner for each of this thing can take a lot of time. Okay. You're saying the measurement also spans over the three-year period of the, the impact measurement? 
yeah. So when I say impoundment, not necessarily three-year period from that aspect of it, because there are some of those things that somebody says at the functional level, can you do something? So we have some of the measures which we uh, sort of look through. So for example, when we, uh, if I have to put it across, say for example, we talked about uh, account opening. So we say, okay, what is the activity-based metrics we have? We have or we don't have. Why? Because based on that, we can do something. So when we started with say internet banking as an exercise, because internet banking is not an option in today's world. That was about five years ago, you know, when we th thought about it, when we were quite late in terms of coming into that. Because from that time, we started digitalization as a process of what we want to do around it, right? So then you say, okay, we at least now we can track digitally what required to be done and build ancillary parts around it, okay? Then as uh, one of the panelists mentioned, how do you do certain things on the back end? And that is quite easy at the functional level because there's a clear matrix you can work out. For example, robotics, when we talked about and we learned about it, okay? So we have moved from X to now 6X in our reconciliation or payment processes. The number of stuff, what we do with the same. Hmm. His question is how you can scale something what you're doing. So that means you need to get into some sort of a metrics of visualizing what our growth path will be. And start from okay. the top. So basically, and, and, yeah. need... and, and some of this data question which you asked earlier becomes that much important hmm. in terms of what to do. The most important thing in all these things is also the qualitative side, which I want to talk about typics because when we talk about process, system, customers, the customer wants is always transient. Okay, so you never know, you can sit back and say, this is what I've done and finished. There's no motivation for the customer to come to this organization anymore. Okay, at the same time, we have to be relevant in terms of what we are doing. So here, when we sort of go through that process, it's also equally important. How do you build the skill set within your teams? It's easier said than done because a lot of people work in many years in the organization. Yeah. And that skill set, the resilience, what you build in, the change management, the adaptability becomes. And how do you manage and say that, how do you put a return on investment on that? Mm -hmm. Customer attrition, mm -hmm. you know? So I think there are multiple factors, both quantitative and qualitative, which we looked at. There are financial factors, cost to income ratios in terms of what you want to do that are typical hardcore numbers which you look at cost per transaction like we can proudly say our cost per transaction has come down more than 70 percent in the last four years and we get into even overheads and calculation of overheads to that extent we go through that processes and in all these things how do you measure the customer experience itself so the customer satisfaction survey shows how well we are doing it what is the cross-sell ratios we are doing with the customer because customer is a basis on which you do what you have to do, right? So in the way we're looking at all these things is, it's never easy because your resourcing is always limited within the time frame, And there is a presentation and our board and management is supportive because in our case, probably we can say that our management level and they represent our business is in IT, in our steering committee, IT steering committee. Mm -hmm. The CFO is in the steering committee. The head of the CEO is in the steering committee. So what happens is we look at most of these things as one goal of what we need to achieve rather than looking at different functions. I know, yeah. No, I think that's a very important point. I think so having a holistic view and going top down as you rightly articulated, uh, Balaji, very useful and very interesting and real life experiences from what you have done. Yeah. Thank you for that. I'm going to open up for a few questions from the audience, if you don't mind. But before we did that, Let's run our third poll for the day. Uh, and here it is. Which of the following functions would therefore be your primary candidate? People in the audience should vote. Would it be customer service? Would it be back office operations? Would it be finance accounting or would it be human resources? And there could be other areas as well, but we picked the top four uh, that the audience can poll. And while the audience poll is, is uh, on. I have a few questions. So if I can actually make, pose this question to Vijay, to you, what would be the difference between intelligent RPA and artificial intelligence? Are they interchangeably used? 
Uh, well, there's a lot of confusion around all these uh, areas, as such, a lot of acronyms. But basically, when you talk about intelligent RPA or intelligent process automation, what you're uh, looking at is a technical solution, which can also interface with an AI aspects. So typically, uh, I showed a case study where we had talked about anti-money laundering, where actually your you, the process as such is used to also collect data. And this is used to interface with an AI solution, which can help you to uh, do predictive analysis. So it's a fusion of various uh, aspects, I would say. So uh, we need to be clear about that. A, a process solution, which involves all this data collection as well as predictive aspects, that's where AI uh, comes in. It's not a standalone AI solution for some problem. It's more of uh, amalgamation of the process automation along with these techniques. Very useful. Thank you, Vijay. Now, uh, there is another question here. And the question is, what are the top three areas in a tier two or three bank that could be considered for RBN? Guess what? The answer to the poll is really going to be the answer to this question. So I'm actually going to go into the poll answers now. And what we have here is an overwhelming majority going for back office operations more than customer service or finance. I can see Krish nodding there. Krish, you have a view on this? I, I think that would be the best start. And so some of the one of the interesting questions that uh, uh, the participant asked was, is it all not going to the customer service? And I, my answer uh, would have been absolutely yes. Uh, not necessarily external customer, internal customer as well, but both are customers end of the day. Your regulators are also your customers. So anything and everything that you do is to the customer, but I absolutely agree with this poll. Back office operations could be the first start of it. Now, there is no reason why you can't do a finance and accounting or human resources or customer service. Uh, back office operations is where the, the uh, error rate could be more as well because of the amount of data, amount of transaction that they deal with. That is also where uh, you know, uh, pretty much most of the critical transactions happen. Right, finance. It, it's about you know the cost, and it is about the money. So that could be a great start. And having to combine the first answer and this, it's about enhancing efficiencies, standardization, controls. Then back office operation is the best candidate to start. Thank you for that, Krish. Well, we are pretty much out of time, and we are three minutes past the schedule. But I still want to with the permission of the audience, go for the last question, which is really the takeaway. And this time I'm also going to allow the panelists to vote. Uh, and this question for everyone is this. In your view, the success factor for a process automation program, and if you had to measure it at the end of it, would be having built the right visibility, managing inhibitions, getting the right partner, or choosing the right process. And with the answers that comes to this poll, we will conclude this conversation. But before that, one last question. There is someone here who's anonymous, so I don't know who's this question from, but it, the question is, what about governing legal regulation and process automation? Any of the panelists would like to take that question? Is there a legal implication in process automation? Balaji. Legal implication? Uh, and what was, other, what was the full question, was it? Uh, the question was, uh, let me go back to the question again, sorry. Uh, what about the governing legal regulation in process automation? Now, I don't know who this person is, so I don't know the details of the question, but that's what it is. Uh, I think uh, whether there's a legal uh, implications, I myself not fully aware uh, in terms of when you say legal is such a broad uh, uh, subject. Is there a regulatory uh, but, implication, I guess, maybe is what he's intending to ask. Here. But in terms of regulatory implication, I'm not sure because in banking industry, if you look at it on the BFSI segment, most of the banks do automation across various other things, right? So one of the look the regulators look for is whether you are compliant with the regulations. How you achieve it is up to the organization to do it. Uh, whether you need to have a governance of managing is answer should be yes. What type of governance structure you need to have, which is more internal in nature. Yeah. Whether there's a legal implications of it, at least I'm not aware of that. Got it. No, I think that's fair. I think it's more about regulation as I think you team it. Well, uh, before uh, we conclude the session, here is the poll results. 
well there is an overwhelming majority that believes choosing the right process is would be the most critical success factor and i don't think that's surprising considering what uh, all of you have actually spoken in the last hour or so so i mean without much ado may i take this opportunity once again to thank uh, uh, krish vijay balaji uh, very wonderful session very interesting uh, if there are other questions that come our way we will obviously pass it on to you audience please feel free to write to us we will do our best to actually get them answered from the panelists and and get back to you thank you once again for staying with us and thank you panelists for a wonderful enriching enlightening session here